Blog Talk Radio. Hello, everyone. This is Chris M, and I'd like to welcome you to another conversation about your Kundalini Awakening experience. Um, in this conversation, we'll be talking about Tantra and the Kundalini. Uh, but before we get going, I would like to invite Santara uh, to come online and to make a few announcements. Santara. Hello, good. Hello, everybody. Um, the first announcement I'd like to make is about the Kundalini Retreat. We have only just a little over two weeks to go before the retreat is in Santa Rosa in California. And that is going to be on Saturday, April the 20th, and on Sunday, April the 21st. So if you're able to join us there, then please let us know, and we will add your name. And um, You can write to me at kundalini matters at gmail.com or you can phone Eileen on 239-246-5608 and we will be delighted to hear from you and answer any questions that you might have. So if I can announce it again later, perhaps, Chris, that's, that's all for now. Yes, and thank you. Thank you, Sid, for making that announcement. You're welcome. Uh, once again, that's on April 20th and 21st, and that's here in Santa Rosa, Northern California. So uh, if any of you would like to come and, and partake of this workshop, this, this uh, retreat, I, I would highly recommend it for people that already have the Kundalini and for people that are searching for the Kundalini or, or trying to arrange for themselves to, to have the Kundalini uh, come to them, which which really uh, brings us to the to the topic of our conversation is tantra. Tantra is a very 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 ancient way of inviting the kundalini to come into a person. Uh, in tantra, various methods are explored that open a person into the divine communication. Uh, and, and in, in most cases, uh, by virtue of having a partner, a partner with them, uh, to, to help both of them explore uh, this aspect of, of reaching in. Uh, with Tantra, you know, there are, in the West these days, there are many different uh, techniques and uh, schools of thought and practices with regards to what Tantra is, and, and there's too many of them to list here right now, but what I am going to do is I'm going to talk with you about what it isn't at this point, you know, what, what it isn't uh, in, at this point in our conversation. The way I approach Tantra is that it is not a, like a, uh, a dating service. It's not there for you to find the quickest, most exciting uh, uh, partner in, in order to engage in, in sexual activity that perhaps you normally wouldn't be able to engage in. Uh, nor is it there for, for purposes of any kind of uh, puerile interests. Um, so I will, I will suggest that... Uh, in our conversation, we're coming uh, into the Tantra with an extreme form of devotion, an extreme form of, of surrender into the divine agenda within each of us. Uh, also, I, I should explain that the Tantra that, that uh, is given through me to give to you from my Kundalini is there are no limitations on how the Tantra can be received by a person. You can receive the, the Tantra uh, expression through uh, energetic exchange uh, of all different types. Uh, the sexual energetic exchange, the emotional energetic exchange, the devotional energetic exchange, even, you know, into ritualism and the, and the ritual energetic exchanges. Uh, it does not lend itself to dark energetic exchanges. The ego in a person will tend to try to manipulate the uh, the sexual expression or the sexual interest 
of a person into areas that are uh, challenging, to say the least, with regards to acceptability in, in uh, certain societies. Uh, and this happens a lot in the West because of our uh, predilection towards pornography, uh, towards the exploitation of, of, of both genders with regards to uh, the volatility of sexual interest uh, and the commercial aspect of the sexual interest in the West and in other areas. And, you know, when I say the West, I'm also talking about uh, people in the in, in the East as well because uh, it's fairly clear uh, that, you know, some challenging sexual expressions are being offered and, and practiced by people, you know, basically all over the world, except for a few societies. Uh, uh, you know, a few societies will, you know, have been able to steer clear of that to some degree. Uh, but with uh, with the Tantra that I espouse, this is all about devotion and divine communication. Divine communication as given through the energetic invitation uh, that two individuals make to themselves and each other at the same time. And as I mentioned before, this energetic exchange will take many, many, many different shapes, many, many different expressions. And uh, we'll go through some of these expressions today. One of the expressions that uh, is commonly uh, looked down upon in our society is the full penetrative uh sexual tantric practice. Um, so many people have been hurt uh, through various uh, ways and uh, sexually and non-sexually that that form of tantra is frowned upon and especially through the, uh, the, the Victorian and Elizabethan standards of conduct which still permeate our society today. Uh, Tantra is not uh, of, of a of an Occidental, you know, European Occidental origin. It is, uh, in many cases, it is from India and it is from the Eastern understandings. And they didn't have as many of the hang-ups about sexual expression as the Occidentals had. Uh, certainly not thousands of years ago, as these practices were being practiced and developed and, and uh, come to us in the way they come to us today. So, with that understanding, uh, some of some of these practices will fly in the face of Western uh, societal acceptability. And I just want you to know that. I want you to know that, understand that, realize that, look at some of the information you may have about uh, about sex and you know the the. Uh, societal limitations that you have agreed to to be born under with regards to the society that you live in. And if you're interested in Tantra, then I would suggest that you begin to release some of these limitations that may have been brought upon you by your uh, being brought up in a certain society. So really look at that and see if you can release some of this programming. Uh, Go beyond the idea that all men are bad or all men are pigs or all women are, you know, prostitutes or whatever. This is, you know, this has given way too much, way too much attention uh, from Hollywood and in the film and television industries. Uh, women are not so easy to categorize and neither are men. So really, we're looking into the deeper spiritual-based, love-based, communication and energetic exchange based areas of the the uh, of the many different practices of energetic exchange within tantra tantra uh, is a study of bringing the kundalini into a person tantra is all about awakening the kundalini that is what it's about that is what people over the centuries thousands of years have tried to use in order to achieve an awakening. Okay? An awakening of Kundalini is considered the highest 
form of spiritual experience that a person can have. It is it is beyond words in its in its activity upon the human uh, equation. It is absolutely stupendous and fantastic and wondrous and magical and beautiful and terrible all at the same time. And people over the world, all over the world, for many, many, many centuries, uh, thousands of years, have, have have striven to awaken the Kundalini with various means. Now, I first mentioned the the, uh, the sexual aspect of tantra, and it is very strong. And what I'm going to say is going to fly in the face of, uh, to a lot of what uh, what you may be reading on the internet or in books or from. You know, the great swamis and lamas and monks and whoever, you know, whatever exalted person you can think of. Uh, with regards to penetrative uh, uh, energetic exchange, the, the reproductive organs of both genders are used, but they're used in specific ways. They're used in ways that allow for the focus and attention of the person to be given into the blending with the other person. The, the, the sexual act is, is, is a form of physical blending and spiritual and energetic bonding and blending at the same time. So with that in mind, uh, some of the Eastern protocols I find to be very, very, very effective uh, such as uh, now in this in this conversation, because of the occidental influence and that people people are even uh, offended at even hearing <laughs> the words that describe the, the reproductive organs of either gender. So I'm going to go into the Sanskrit with this, and and the male reproductive uh, organ will be called the Shiva Lingam. Once again, the male reproductive organ is referred to as the Shiva Lingo. And the female reproductive organ is referred to as the Yoni. Now, for for those of you that have have studied Tantra and that have, you know, explored this, this is very, very basic for you, and I understand that. And and, uh, and we'll just, you know, you just have to be patient with, with everybody who isn't quite up to speed as you are with regards to these terminologies. So, uh, to get right into it, the the level of exchange isn't just the process of the merging of the lingam and the yoni. It is, that's not what it's all about. Those are just aspects of it. We also merge through the eyes, through the eyesight. We also merge through the tactility of touch, of skin to skin, neuron tactility to neuron tactility. And so there, this is a combination, and if you followed any of my conversations or the uh, YouTubes, oh, and I should say that, uh, you know, the uh, YouTube channel is Chrisim, the number zero, Kundalini, so it looks like Chrisim O Kundalini uh, on the YouTube uh, uh, network. Uh, if you followed any of those, uh, you'll you'll find that I often mention combinations. Combinations. Not one way to do this or that. Not a single practice. It's a combination of different ways and different practices. Uh, So often we get caught up into absolutism with how we describe practices that we feel are best or that work for us. And... and, uh, if I'm going to be absolute about anything, is that nothing is absolute. I'm absolutely sure that nothing is absolute. Uh, there are always different ways to do different things, and we all come into this experience with different levels of karma. Uh, and so we are all unique within our process, and yet we're also similar within our process through through the uh, the uh, the joining. Uh, of what it is we're, we're, we're attempting to do with awakening the Kundalini. So a person can be benefited through different levels of the of the penetrative uh, blending of the yoni and the lingam. 
And yet at the same time, you must have a supreme level of love for this person. Some people are able to just love. Just love. They can find love. And you need to differentiate love from lust. Okay. This isn't about lust. This isn't about watch swapping or, you know, having fun with something different, you know, someone different because you, you know, you feel bored with your marital uh, expressions. No, this is not about that. This is about the kundalini. And let me tell you, the kundalini is extremely powerful. And you don't want to come into it with a trivial attitude. So within the inter- interpenetrative uh, aspect, uh, a ceremony of devotion for the person you're going to blend with is very, very helpful because it begins to bring the ego consciousness and the higher consciousness into an alignment with what it is you're doing. So bring a gift. Share some wine. No, non-alcoholic wine, of course. <laughs> you know, I'm not, uh, I, I, I really don't support any kind of alcoholic consumption. But share a, 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 a juice or water or tea or something on a level that is something that, that the both of you can take in. It is the action of bringing in to your body that is important right now. Find a way to celebrate the other person in a loving, happy, joyful, uh, confident way. Okay. Uh, make sure that it is in, in no way abusive or dominating or in any way uh, bringing uh, the value of that person down in your eyes or in their eyes, in their in their personal experience. Um, candles can be helpful, a helpful part of the ceremony uh, as natural light. Uh, make sure it's a you know nicely ventilated area, warm. Uh, the color red and blue are very uh, helpful. Gold and silver also very helpful. Uh, this we're just talking about the little devotional ceremonies that come into play with regards to the to the physical penetrative techniques that are that I'm actually blending with uh, with some of the other energetic techniques as well. And as you as you meet that other person and you begin to blend with them by sharing the water, sharing the light, sharing the space, sharing uh, the color, sharing each other. Uh, begin to really focus on loving that person. And not just their physical being, but who they are as a person. Who they are. Whatever kind of positive history that you have of them, with them, begin to really feel. And this is before you even touch that person. This really begins to set the stage for your mental and emotional expressions to become uh, engaged in this practice. Really, and and I don't care how long you've been together, begin to really appreciate the unique person that you're seeing with your eyes. And if you've listened to the other uh, conversations I've had, eyesight is a form of energetic exchange. When you look at something, you, you bond with it. There is a there is a a form of energetic bonding that occurs. Whether or not you know what it is you're seeing, you're still seeing it. And uh, eyesight and vision have weight. And one day we'll be able to be measured. Okay. There's consciousness behind eyesight. Consciousness uh, is projected through the means of the eyesight uh, onto whatever object it is you're viewing or whatever other person it is you're viewing. So as you see this wonderful person across from you, begin to really feel the love that you have for that person, the wonder and the, and the blessed experience that that person is in your life. 
You don't need to have music playing, but soft music can be playing in the background if that's something that is is agreeable to both of you. As long as it doesn't take your focus off what it is you're doing. In some ways, this can be seen as a dance, but in other ways, it is also seen as a, a serene meditation. And to blend the two, you could say it's a, it's a moving meditation. So when you when you engage in this, really begin to to move your emotions in a positive, loving way into that other person, and as they will be doing, vice versa, and go very, very slowly and very, very considerately with this other person. This is not a fast process. This is a, a slow moving end, so to speak. And this is something that that should be taken with a, a great level level of, of sanctity, sacredness, and devotion. Because really, really, no matter how you approach Tantra, you're approaching God, the goddess within. And this is the holy of the holy. This is the most sacred practice that you can do. This is something that that will change your life forever. Even just the memory of it can change your life forever. Okay. So know this and understand this and engage in this in a way that allows yourself to blend significantly and lovingly with that other person just through your eyes. Just through your eyes. And remember that with every cell in your body, there is a complete you. So let's talk about a potential 17 trillion yous wanting to blend with the 17 trillion of your partner. And realize that every cell being having the capacity for becoming a complete human being also has all the functions and organs of that complete human being. And so these are also bonding with that other person. So you can literally see through all of these cells, through all of these cellular networks, you can see, you can feel, you can hear, you can touch, you can taste. You can do all the all the five senses. Okay? Within this within within this practice, you just need to expand the parameters of your understanding to in to, to include these manifestations. And as you, you come near to your partner, use those five senses and let the 17 trillion other aspects of yourself use their five senses as well, all in one single expression of love. Let's be clear. Love is what binds us together. Love is what allows us to to burn through our karma and to have this physical experience. Love is the strongest force. So go with the strongest force as you begin to make yourself prepared to have the divine loving influence, which would be the Kundalini. So when you touch them, you see them, and you experience them on all levels of of, uh, of sensory-based understanding. And yet, because you have prepared and because you know this is a, a, a slow, dancing, moving meditation, your, your emotions are already tied into them. And in a way, you may start to feel your chakras bonding with their chakras forming a unity, a unity of, of bonding with the energetic centers. And, of course, for those of you who don't know what a chakra is, uh, chakras are energetic uh, centers that that are positioned on the spine. And, and, a, and a first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh chakra, seventh chakra being at the top of the head and the first chakra being in the last three vertebrae of the tailbone and all the other ones in between. Uh, at another time, we'll go into what those meanings are. But as you're as you're as you're bonding with this person in a tantric fashion, uh, you you feel energetic bonds 
with their chakras, with their energetic center, the fourth chakra being that of, of a heart and, and expressive of love. And I may, I may have to go into these right now because they're pertinent to our discussion. Uh, the first chakra is of uh, survival and, and sustenance and reproduction and the many, many various levels of, of what it takes to survive and what it takes to have autonomic uh, systems within the human body, breathing, heartbeat, things of that, uh, of that level. The second chakra has to do with uh, the emotions and, and with uh, the salts of the, of the body, you know, taking in salt, taking out salt. has to do with the, uh, also with the reproductive and more of the sexual aspect of the of the person, and the uh, it is also the uh, one of the power generative centers. The intestines being used like an electrical coil uh, for an energy that is known uh, primarily by many people as chi, or spelled C H I, so you can pronounce it chi or ki uh, energy in the human being, the third chakra being that of the self and the connection to the cosmos, the, the first, you know, the, the, the top of the first uh, trinity or the first pyramid within the body is the third chakra. Uh, it has to do with your strength and the, and the levels of strength and recognition of self and your connectedness to the, to the cosmos that you, that you have. And I'm just giving you thumbnail sketches here, I'm just going through this really quick. Uh, the fourth chakra is, of course, uh, talking about the uh, love, divine love, self-love, ego love, uh, fear, uh, love gained, love lost, and all the different ramifications. It's a huge energetic uh, experience. Uh, the, the fourth chakra is a universe of itself, as are all the chakras. Uh, but the fourth chakra deals with love, deals with that. Maha, that powerful force of love. And so, you know, I could do a whole entire 20,000 shows just on the fourth chakra and, it, and its effect upon our lives. But I'm just giving you that thumbnail sketch right now for those of you who aren't familiar with, with chakras. The fifth chakra is located at the throat. The fourth chakra is here. The fifth chakra is here at the throat. Uh, it's typically blue. You'll notice that I follow the Hindu system of chakra recognition. Uh, that correlates with my kundalini uh, better than any other system, and there are other systems. Uh, once again, we're not being absolute here, but this is just something that that uh, has correlated with my kundalini uh, to give to you with regards to yours. And you are, of course, open to explore any other method or methodology that you would like to explore with regards to Kundalini. I'm not going to say that mine is the only one. You know, that's what's coming through me for you is the only system. It is not. There are many other systems. Okay. So the blue chakra at the throat is, is of course, uh, devoted to communication and the, the many different levels of communication and sensory sensory input, uh, uh, the, the taste and the, the, the smell and eyesight and hearing. Many of these areas are covered by the, uh, the fifth chakra as well as um, much of the endocrine system as well is covered by that, by that chakra. And then we move up to here where you see a lot of the the Hindu women will have a big red splotch here, like they shot with a gun right through here. Uh, that's the sixth chakra, and it's not so much here, it's more like here. Uh, and for those who have Kundalini or coming into the Kundalini, you actually feel where it is because it starts to come out, it starts to open up. Uh, this has to do with intuition and, and psychic. Uh, um, Phenomena, as well as spiritual phenomena, as well as uh, you know, you begin to walk into the levels of spiritual experience through the merging of the two eyes and the third eye here. So you start to be able to see overlays of spiritual interaction with the physical interaction. Uh, and, and once again, it is also a very, very, very powerful chakra, and yet 
uh, so little is known of it. And maybe that can be uh, a topic of some shows. We'll do a topic for each chakra if people will be interested in that. Um, so the top of the head, the entire top of the head, is the seventh chakra, the crown chakra, the thousand-petaled lotus uh, within the uh, Sanskrit understanding, in the Hindu understanding. Uh, it is the crown jewel. It is the holy of the holies. It is the, it is the location of divine incorporation and connection on the human body. So in many of the 16th century Occidental paintings, uh, you will see a golden head. Um, one topic I haven't dis discussed here yet is uh, dismemberment. And the uh, that's the Kundalini dismembering the body and putting it back together in a in a fashion that is that is better for the person. And in many of the Occidental paintings, you'll see the golden head. The golden head is an indication that the person has awakened their Kundalini. And this is that they're going through a, a Kundalini dismemberment rather than just you know a, being drawn and quartered or things of that nature. And so these are the seven chakras, and these seven chakras will begin to blend within the tantric expression. And as these begin to blend, so do the spinal cords begin to blend. The, the, the two idas and the two pingalas, which are the, the ida and the pingala, are, the, are what you see in the doctor's uh, caduceus, you know, coming up. Uh, you'll see two snakes doing this, coming up over and down, and you'll see wings coming out at the top, and that's what the MDs wear to indicate that they're, a, you know, an MD. Uh, but actually what this is, is this is an external symbol of Kundalini awakening. And uh, the Idas and the Pingalas will resonate with each other, and it's like, it's like a harp, like a beautiful, harmonious harp that is being played, and, and uh, it is the music is being offered to the divine male and the divine female uh, within both people. So there's two divine males and there's two divine females and they're becoming one. They're becoming one. And it is that oneness that will begin to to germinate within the person. This will happen for everyone that, that attempts uh, tantric uh, expression. But it can happen if you keep at it, you go at it in the right way, you follow the right teachings, it can happen for you. You've got it within you. So don't think that because it didn't happen for you the first time or the first 20 times, you just have to have the diligence to keep trying. And, of course, within the Tantra format, it's a very beautiful experience. And so, of course, there's it's not that hard to keep trying, let me tell you. So as the people approach each other, and they look at each other, and they bond with the eyesight. When, when you're looking at each other, you look right into the pupil of the eye. Right into the pupil of the eye. And you, you try very diligently not to waver that gaze. This is a tantric gaze. And a person, an awakened person, can actually send light into that gaze. And, and having tantra with an, uh, with an awakened person is a very different experience than having tantra with an unawakened person. Um, but I'll get into that perhaps later. Uh, as you as you as you look into that person's soul and you feel, and you open your heart, you open your soul for that other person to see you. You willingly expose yourself to that to that love that the other other person is giving you. The love. And, and be gentle with this. Don't be forceful with this. Don't try to dominate. Don't try to be anything but, but a loving and considerate person as you do this. Uh, and I, I, I hear me pausing before I say certain words and it's because I keep wanting to say God or Goddess. Because this is what the person that is that is practicing tantra for the, the enlightenment and the awakening really is. 
This is what you have. This is the path that you're attempting to find within yourself, with each other. So as you as you stare into the soul, into the windows of the soul, the eyes of the person, stare with the intentions of love. Stare with the intentions of grace. Heat, beauty, joy, love, love, love. Let that permeate. And as you reach out towards each other and you begin that first gate of tactile communication, feel your body with love. Let every touch, let every cellular membrane resonate with that level of love so that you begin to to flow continuously with high levels of devotional love. Recognize the God and the goddess in the other person. Recognize them. Say hello to them. Love them. Invite them into expression. This is a gift that you are giving to each other. You give for the enlightenment of the other person. They give for the enlightenment of you. So you're not so much about your selfishness. Oh, I want my kundalini awakened. Oh, I want to be able to levitate and fly. You're not about these things at all. You're all about giving to that other person so that they, they may have enlightenment. And they are not thinking of themselves either. They're thinking of you. and how you can have enlightenment. You see, it is an act of selflessness. Giving through love is an act of selflessness. We don't give through love and expect to have love given to us. You understand? The tantra with a partner, tantra, uh, you need to give for the grace of that other person because you love them so much. And now that I've told you, I want you to, to go into this. Thing. Okay, all right. I want them to become enlightened so that I can become enlightened. So now, <laughs> don't do that. Try not to be uh, self-oriented. Be oriented more towards that other person. Helping them, feeling them, inviting divinity into them. As you can expect that. I mean, you don't want to expect it, but they will also be doing this for you in their own way, as you do this for them in your unique way. And as you begin to touch and as you begin to caress, let the touch speak volume. Let the touch deliver uh, telepathic pictures of love and happiness and grace. Feel the bonding that you have with the chakras. Feel the tactility of their 17 trillion with your 17 trillion cells. Let this occur in a very sacred and beautiful way. And then smell them. Smell their scent. Smell their vision. Smell the way they feel. That's right. We're using the senses in ways that they're not typically used. Expand yourself into this. I know at first you're thinking, well, how can I smell a vision? Hmm. Don't worry, you can. You have the capability. Don't try to figure it out. Just let it happen. Don't let your mental figuring machine uh get caught up into figuring this out. Some things you're not allowed to figure out. Some things you just get to experience. Okay. Like dreams. Science still hasn't figured out dreams. Oh, they can stimulate the brain this way and that. I'm sure they can they can match an electromagnetic frequency and they can they can tell what you may be thinking and things like that, but they don't know the source of dreams. They're just messing around with you and making that. So be advised. So as you as you touch the other person and you smell the other person and you feel their the community that they are, they feel the community that you are, and you just feel the love and 
and you want to give them that love in the way that an awakening can give a person. And they do the same for you. You begin to form this one energetic bonding. And as as this continues, slowly, very slowly, slowly, let the body express itself. But the lips and the tongue and the taste and the smell and the, and the feelings and the vision begin to to accelerate its response. But don't let don't let the desire body totally control you. You control it. The the, the yoni will want to be to be penetrated. The the, the lingam will want to do the penetration. And I will suggest that you do this. But I will suggest that you begin to go slow with it and you, you also begin to use uh, the yab yam position, which is the, the woman sitting on top of the man and the man uh, holding the woman in his lap. Okay. Uh, that is the position. And there are many, many words for this position. Uh, but I'm just going to go with the description because, you know, we don't need to, to run for the translation book every time we want to, to discuss something. So... As you get into this position, uh, the, the Shiva Lingam will be straight and tall. Uh, the jade stalk, as the, as the Asians call it. Uh, and the Yoni will be, will be uh, ready for, 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 its, for its joining. And in this, in this Tantra, we'll discuss that the, the Shiva Lingam will enter the Yoni very slowly, very securely, but without thrusting, uh, which is the natural proclivity for the man. Uh, no thrusting. Uh, you will definitely uh, feel the difference, but it is, it, is, it is the sacred feminine who dances on the platform of the, of the Shiva Lingam. So the yoni is the one that gets to move around. And she can move around as much as she wants within within the understanding of what it is she's there to do for you. And what you are there to do for her is to provide her for that platform, that, that placement, that uh, you are the ground that she dances upon. And this is a real this is a real switch because typically it is the sacred feminine that is the ground that we all walk upon. And it is the sacred male that shines down upon the ground. And so what you're seeing now is is the sacred male assuming the position of the sacred female and the sacred female assuming the position of the sacred man. Do you see how this fits together? Do you see how this this forms a a union a union when we become that other person and that other person becomes us? So I want you to really, really look at this, meditate on it. If it's, if it's a hard concept for you to 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 receive, meditate on it. Let it soak into you. Let it. Let it explain itself to you. Okay? And this will go on and on and on. Um, the dance will continue. The dance will continue. And I will I will instruct the sacred male not to lose his seed. The seed need not be uh, uh, given unless a child is to be made. Or, or in, in the case of a of a of a uh, of an awakened person. Uh, so, with with regards to the seed, keep the seed within as best you can. And for those for those who are dancing, uh, be be considerate of that seed. There are seven fluids that make up the seed of a person. All the fluids will carry uh, an energetic signature 
the the pre the precede, shall we say, the P R E dash S E E D uh will come out as as a clear fluid and in that in that understanding uh everything that is needed for activation is in that clarity, is in that fluid. It, it doesn't necessarily have to be something that is forming a, a, a physical child in the young. Okay, so that's not what it's all about. The, uh, the, the pre-ejaculate is, is all the fluid that is really needed with regards to tantric uh, understanding being given. So as 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 the dance continues and the dance continues and the dance continues, um, realize and keep staring at each other's eyes. You know, say the words "I love you, I love you, I love you" over and over and over. Let that be your mantra for each other. And this is one way to begin the awakening process um, for two people. Okay, this is one way for this to occur. Another way is just through the eyes, just through the eyes of a person. And you can give that expression to each other with just the eyes. Uh, Some people will promote a clothed version of of sitting upon one another. I'm not going to say that won't work, but I'm going to say that it's, There are some issues that are coming up that that deal with uh, exposing oneself or the honesty of the expression. Uh, if you're not willing to expose yourself, then don't do this. Don't do this. If you've got hang-ups of a sexual level or a, uh, you know, if you've suffered trauma, at the hands of a gender and, and, you know, you're in hatred of that gender and so you try to find that gender in another gender and, it, you know, it, it can get very convoluted. And I will suggest that you need to heal yourself first of that initial trauma. Don't run away from it. Don't try to change your uh, expression of divinity in a way that... that uh, allows you to to run away. These experiences happen to us for reasons, and we need to be adult enough to to look into these reasons and to find balance within those reasons without maintaining a hatred or an anger uh, for another person. So I'm not really um, a proponent of the clothed sitting in the yab yam position that many sexologists and tantric teachers will use because of the occidental maxims against exposing uh, people. Neither neither will I suggest tantric parties where we all get together and everybody, you know, does this the form of tantra that I just described to you in detail. Uh, I'm not a proponent of that either. Once again, this is not for sexual gratification at all. At all. Okay. Now let's see. I need to. I need to look to see how much time I have left in this. Maybe you can tell me, uh, Santara. Yes, you have forty minutes. Oh, good, good, good. Forty minutes left. Uh, yeah. Thank you, thank you, my dear. Um. What is happening with this conversation is it's being filmed and it's being recorded uh, in other ways so that uh, we can make sure that, uh, and I'll be doing this with all of them in the future, so that we can make sure that people have access to this information later on. Um, Tantra is is seeking the the marriage of the divine male and the divine female, but it's going through the feminine first. Uh, Tantra is often described as the left-hand path, which is, of course, 
the left-hand path is the left side of the body, which is often where the uh, the uh, Shakti or the sacred feminine Kundalini will come up. You know, and people have the experience of their left big toe turning black, and you know, definitely feeling, uh, uh, say, frigidity on the on the left side of the body, or, or some sort of psychic uh, development along the left side of the body. So Tantra is this invitation. In the ancient, in the ancient peoples, uh, the temple priests and the temple priest were often the teachers of Tantra. They were the people that the that the community would go to for spiritual uh, enlightenment, for spiritual means of conduct, for living their lives in a in a, in a deeply spiritual way, and uh, which is which is far more prevalent then than it is now. To a large degree, uh, our our society is more worshiping of science and and you know greed for monetary uh, possession, physical possession. Uh, so in in many ways, in the in the nineteenth and, 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 and our twentieth century now, uh, from the well from the age of uh, you know before the industrial Re- revolution in the late 1800s to the present moment, we're all about our machines. We're all about, you know, A plus B equals C. We're all about science. And, and we're drifting farther and farther away from our spiritual roots uh, because we're so dependent upon science. Where You have to remember that God created the, the ability in man to have an understanding of science, not the other way around. Man has not created a science that allows us to understand God. The only way man can understand God is by having Kundalini. And Tantra is one method of finding God through the awakening of the Kundalini. But the Tantra is the path towards the awakening. For those of you that already have the Kundalini, you don't need to practice Tantra, except as a as a beautiful blessing uh, that you can give to other people. For those of you that already have Kundalini, you can use Tantra as a as a platform of furtherance, furthering uh, your experience within the sacred divine and the sacred male, furthering your path and your journey up into the mountain of enlightenment that you are already walking. Okay. So Tantra does have its applications for the awakened person, but you don't need to use it for uh, further activation, so to, so to speak. For further activation, you should use the safety protocols. The safety protocols will help you more there. Uh, so the, the high priestess of both, the high priest and the high priestess uh, in, the, in the ancient ancient understandings were there for people to learn about their spiritual heritage. And it just so happened that instead of, uh, you know, tending the flock of, of whatever animal or growing the crops, these people were predilected to devote themselves into the higher learnings of spiritual nature. It didn't make them better or worse than other people, but it did make them uh, necessary for these other societies to learn from. Okay. Now, as I mentioned earlier, you can just you can have eye tantra. You can have touch tantra, but touch tantra, once again you need to expand your your understanding of your of the community that you are. And I'm just using seventeen trillion as a as a as a, as a number. Um, I am sure that there are more or less you know, we are each individual people, and we each have our own uh, understanding of. We each have our own unique expression, and that will include how many cells we have in our body. Um, at this time, I would like uh, Centara to give out the numbers. Would you do that, my dear? Yes, I will, of course. And um, you can call in on three four seven. 
I give that out again. It's 347-934-0026. And do we have any questions at this time, Santara? No, I'm not sure the chat room is working. <laughs> so there are no questions there. <laughs> very good, very good. Lots, no. lots of people logged in, but nobody typing back to my messages. So, yeah. Yeah, well, it's it's a, definitely a learning curve for for this uh, for this this platform. Uh, so so there are many different and thank you thank you Centaur for doing that. Uh, there are many different levels of tantra. Um, what I've been discussing for the most part of this conversation are the the levels of tantra that most of you are familiar with, uh, such as the sexual tantra physical tantra, the combinations of tantras, of different tantras that make up the physical tantra and and vice versa as well. So I'm going to go into the vice versa part of it right now. Devotion. Not only, uh, and, and I've had a conversation uh, about devotion already, and I encourage you all to, to listen to that. Uh, devotion is huge. Devotion is a form of love. And this love is key to the opening of the gates of Kundalini within a person. It took me a while to to figure that one out myself. And and I had devotion at the time, but I didn't know why I had it. Now I know why I had it. Uh, Devotion is the key that unlocks the door or the gate of the Kundalini. And what this is, devotion can be, is a form of Tantra, actually. I was going to say devotion can be used as a Tantra, and it, and it can be, but it is also, in and of itself, a form of, of Tantra. When you are devotional enough, devotion really is the giving of a supreme level of attention and love and care and consideration and trust and surrender all at the same time, all at the same time, towards the object of your devotion. Typically, the object of your devotion should not be a a, uh, a spouse or a boyfriend or a girlfriend. This needs to be given to a higher, a higher uh, representative of grace uh, within your understanding, God, goddess. Uh, saint this, saint that. Um, and if you have a an awakened teacher that you're following, well, then you can give that kind of devotion to them. Uh, but not to, you know, the, the spouse or the boyfriend or the girlfriend. Uh, they, yes, 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 you give them love. You give them love. And there's a certain level of devotion that you give to them, but you don't give them the same devotion that you would Jesus or Mary or Buddha or Muhammad or your or or a teacher that you that you may be following. And so this is what I'm saying. The devotional tantra is a complete exposing of yourself to that personage or that guide or that teacher. Where there is nothing left of yourself. There is nothing left of your soul. You have given your love, your life, your control of your life, uh, all your possessions, all of your your entire body, everything you give to them through an action of devotion. Okay. An action of devotion. And this, in and of itself, has the ability to to open the kundalini flow within a person. Uh, so I'm going to say that you need to really be careful, naturally, about who you choose to give this type of devotion to. Okay. Uh, you need to trust them. You need to trust them. You need to to want to give to them. And they need to be open and to, to, to receiving that from you. Not everybody is. Not all teachers are. Not all. Uh, no, it's just. The reason why we choose so many dead teachers in our in our many societies is because the dead teachers don't really have an option to say no. Well, I'm going to choose, you know, so and so, and 
Even though so-and-so, like Gautama or Jesus, said, don't worship me, well, even you don't really give them the choice. You say, well, I'm going to worship you anyway. So what I'm suggesting is that you begin to to give that teacher or that personage the devotion, uh, but also give the devotion to the, the kundalini within. As you expose yourself to that living teacher or that dead teacher, give yourself to the divine within. Give yourself to the divine within. Expose yourself to the divine within. It's very important. Not so much with the expectation of, oh, divine within, will you open my kundalini flow? No, no. When you're in this kind of a devotion, all levels of asking or expectation have left you. By giving so much, you receive automatically so much. Okay. And accept what it is you're receiving with grace and gratitude rather than asking for more. Okay. With uh, with this type of devotional tantra, it's the same kind of tantra that you would do with a partner in the physical level, except that you don't need a partner. You don't need a physical partner. You're partnering with that teacher or that personage. And you're definitely partnering with the the two that are one within you. Not everybody has the ability to attract a mate. Not everybody has the ability or the desire to to you know have a have a flesh uh, spouse or, 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 or you know person in their life that way. It's just not that way for everyone. It's that way with most. Agreed. It is that way with most, but it is not that way with everyone. And certainly not everyone on a spiritual path. Let's look at the at the people in Tibet and China and, and uh, India who who renounce, uh, you know, joining with another person in in, a, in the flesh. Uh, they renounce any kind of sex or celibate. Uh, they renounce any kind of an attachment to another person. And I honor them, and I and I respect them, and I and I think that is a very good way to do these things. But I also think that another very good way is to give love, give uh, that love to another person, be with another person, make that child, raise that child. This is another way of reaching into the exalted areas of spirituality. You'll notice that a lot of Kundalini awakened people have kids. Hello. They have children. Some of them have many children. Okay, so it is not a you know it is not a rule that says that oh my gosh since since I want to to have Kundalini awakened and I want to 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 be in, become enlightened and all of these things that oh I can't have uh, uh, a relationship with a person that's false. Of course you can have a relationship with a person depends on. on how you want to go with it. You do not have to become a celibate monk, priest, whatever, in order to to attain the gifts of grace. You don't. Now that may happen after you attain the gifts of grace. You know that. You know the grace itself may say, "Well, well, well, well it's good." Granted, you know you were having this relationship, and, and uh, you, you know, I have come to you. Gracious speak. I have come to you, Christopher. Now, now I want you to back off of this, 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 and that. That can happen. That can happen. And as I have taught in other conversations, you need to pay attention to that. And if you're with a spouse or a, or a, or a significant other, they need to understand. And if they don't understand, then you need to help them allow you to have that understanding and not in impugn upon your personal understanding, okay? Uh, so this goes into that other conversation about Kundalini and, and those around us who don't have it. Uh, Sitara, can I have the time again? 
Yes, you have 25 minutes to go now. Thank you. Any questions at all? No questions. Oh, hold on. Okay. Okay. I'm holding. What are some of the types tantra? What are some of the tantra types? We have the energetic exchange. All tantra is energetic exchange. Uh, we have the physical tantra. We have the devotional tantra. We have the the uh, tantra of all the different um, uh, senses. So we have tantras for each sense. Okay. We have tantra. We have partner tantra. We have uh, singular tantra, tantra without a partner. Uh, there are many, many, many different types of tantra. Who's asking this? Somebody in the chat room. Okay. All right, yeah. Uh, really, for, for me to put a numerical uh, measurement on how many tantras exist would be would be incorrect because as many tantras exist as there are different people who wish to practice different things. Uh, there's the Tao of sex that uh, is practiced in many of the, the uh, Chinese... Uh, uh, positions, uh, you know, and, and and you know that in it's, uh, of itself is, is, a, is a way of treating the, the sexual act as a as a form of, of Asian tantra. Uh, yeah, there are many, many, many different tantras, but in this conversation, I basically wanted to to focus on what people knew the most about tantra and about. Tantra. And in the West, which is really what we're geared towards right now is a Western understanding. In the West, the word Tantra automatically means sex. It automatically, you know, people just say, oh, Tantra, that means sex. So, <laughs> so um, I'm giving them a, a recipe for a, a different understanding, a different appreciation of the physical blending that that Tantra can represent. It doesn't need to represent sexual blending, but it does in many ways. In many ways, it does. Uh, and once again, in this, in this conversation, we're not so much discussing uh, what happens when you have awakened the Kundalini and then you're going into to having tantric expression. We're not I don't want to talk about that in this exchange. I'll, t I'll talk about that in another conversation because there's just there's too much to get to in, in that. But what I'm talking about right now is the commonly understood uh, Western ideology of what Tantra is. And in the West, and, I, and I'm sure there are plenty of Tantra teachers out there going, oh, no, 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 it doesn't mean that. And, you know, sexologists are going, oh, no, no, no. And some of them are going, oh, yes, yes, yes. Um, this is what is being given from my Kundalini to give to you about the Tantra at this time. It is, I'm not reading this from a book. I'm not, I mean, I have books on Tantra, but I just, I've never read them. I thought they might be helpful. Or for for helping others with it, and really, it's just it's the Kundalini that comes through this, and it, it it gives a very very specific teaching on on different levels that allow a person to understand uh, one of the best methods of approaching the sexual tantra uh, that may not be understood clearly, or you may have to pay a thousand dollars to receive. Um, I don't know how much money people have spent in, in, uh, in uh, being able to listen to this conversation. How much money have they spent listening to this conversation, Santara? <laughs> um, not a lot. Right. But, you know, they had to buy a computer. They had to, you know, that type of thing. But they use that right. for other things. So, so, for instance, you know, I'm being told by many people that I should charge for this information. And I and I, I may have to start charging for this information because you know it's you know it's hard to to do these things and to to 
to do them without uh, any kind of, uh, of support of a financial level. And so I want to, to let you know that we do take donations and we take them and we're appreciative of them. Uh, and if you, if you enjoy these conversations, um, feel free to, <laughs> to, to give a donation. Uh, I, I, I swear I'm sounding like a, a public radio station now asking for donations. And I've never wanted to do that, but, but we are, we're, you know, we're struggling to to stay afloat with these conversations. So, if you do enjoy them, then feel free to to uh, send something to Santara or myself or or Eileen Laurel. She's another person you can send to. If you wish to to give to me, then it's uh, K F I R E F O R at Yahoo dot com. That's K Fire for All at Yahoo dot com, and. and uh, uh, Santara, what's your email? My email is kundalini matters at gmail dot com, and you can drop me a line, and I can let you know a little bit more about how to donate. And it would be very, very much appreciated because it's it's quite essential, really. And um, so all donations would be very much appreciated. So kundalini matters at gmail dot com. And. Um uh, also, for Eileen Loro's uh, email, her oh, email I'm is L O R O five five at yahoo dot com. That's E L O R O five five at yahoo dot com. Uh, she she is also an integral part of the Kundalini Awakening System One uh, administration. So, if there are no more questions. And, and people don't want to call in or don't feel called to call in. I will go ahead and, and end it at this time. Uh, uh, Santara, can you make your announcement again? I can. There are no questions at this time. Um, yes, just to let you know again about the Kundalini Awakening Retreat that has been held in Santa Rosa, and that is on April the 20th. It's a Saturday, and on April the 21st, a Sunday, and this is led by CRISM. And it's an intensive, an intensive study and preparation for the reception and integrative of Kundalini Awakening. And if you are awakened, awakening, or you are, as CRISM said, seeking Kundalini, then everybody is very, very welcome. It's going to be a wonderful two days. So you could phone Eileen if you would like more information on 239-246-5. Or you can write to me at kundalini matters at gmail dot com. Okay, thank you, Santor. Yep. Yeah. And I must say that that is in Santa Rosa, Northern California, United States. Okay. So just to to give you a a proper geographical context. And if there are no more questions, then then I would like to say my blessings to you all, and may you all. Have beautiful tantra with each other. Thank you.